Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera. So let's begin by talking about this. The disease we're going to be talking about today is called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. That's the old name. Now everybody wants to talk about uh, complex regional pain syndrome. The same thing. But let's talk basically about that disease and remind you. And by the way, if I'm speaking too fast, Umberto. Go like this, okay? Slow down. Despacio, okay? Um, there are other disease states that are similar. A big one is fibromyalgia. Another one, which isn't pain, but it's pain up here. Mucho, mucho dinero. Uh, depression. Intractable depression. That means it's worse than pain in a way because the lights never come on. It's dark all the time in the brain, okay? And we know ketamine can be very effective in that situation as well. But we're going to focus today on the complex regional pain syndrome, okay? Now, why are, what we're going to focus in on is what we call how to measure pain. Because, you know, everybody's, oh, it's subjective. Yeah. How can we rely on that? If I come to Umberto, he has a big white coat on, and, and uh, he looks like a professor. And he does. He does look like a professor. Make sure you get a picture of him. Over there. <laughs> over there. Professor Umberto. <laughs> um, that the patients, they don't want to tell you the bad news, usually. They want to tell you, you know, I came all the way from the United States to Cuba to get my pain treatment, and it didn't work. No, they, want, they don't want to do that. So what we try to do at the foundation is try to base everything on objective analysis uh, in terms of pain. And also, don't forget, with pain you have dysfunction, range of motion, strength, and all those sorts of things. So what we want to focus in on today is how to measure this pain objectively. That's going to be our focus, okay? So the first thing I need to tell you is just briefly, not in detail, I need to tell you about what is uh, this complex regional pain syndrome, okay? You have to remember that it's a clinical diagnosis. What do I mean? There's no laboratory test for it. There is, there is no laboratory test. So, but you can get a pretty objective picture if you're dealing with RSV, um, if you have the right tools. For example, let's talk about the clinical history. When do you think you have RSD? Let's, it's when the first criteria, there's three criteria. Well, number one, when the injury does not follow the normal healing course. For example, if you get a sprained thumb, you expect within a week the swelling's going down, the pain's decreasing. But if the pain is increasing, and especially if it turns to more like a burning pain, then you have to think maybe RSD. And if the pain is spreading, now it's going up the arm, into the face, or into the legs. The patient is either crazy, or they have RSD. So now you get into one of the, the challenges of dealing with this disease. Because some of the symptomatology, the symptoms, what the patient describes, sound like they're crazy. So you as a good doctor, you have to be able to distinguish between the emotional symptoms and the real uh, disease state. Right. So, one of the things that helps a lot is that when you develop RSD, it involves the sympathetic nervous system. So the, the second criteria, besides the fact that it doesn't follow the normal healing course, is that there's uh, abnormal function of the sympathetic nervous system. And as you know, as doctors, is that the sympathetic nervous system controls blood, blood flow, for example, to the skin. You get an injury, you're walking along, you step on some glass, it's an emergency, your sympathetic nervous system is activated, so the blood vessels in your skin contract, 
So you don't spill blood all over the place. If you're in Cuba and the police are chasing you down the street, <laughs> your sympathetic nervous system is up. So more blood goes into your legs so you can run faster than the police, right? <laughs> Same thing in the United States. We have the same thing. So it's, a, it's, it's an emergency response, okay? What does that mean? That means that normally it happens on both sides. You step on glass with your right foot, your left foot also contracts. With RSD, what happens? It becomes asymmetrical. Very important concept. So the right leg may be colder. It may be warmer. It, it could be either way, but it's not the same on both sides. That's why measuring temperature, like with this infrared scanner, which I'm showing you here, is important. So, for example, if we take Alberto here and we measure... I, I guess I'm bad. I no, you're I'm still bad. alive. You're 33.5. Uh, but, yeah. Alberto, I got some bad news for you. Your temperature is decreasing. <laughs> you're know, slowly, you're I slowly dying. I can't lose my hot stuff. <laughs> So this is a valuable tool. Again, it's objective. It's an objective measurement that you can make, okay? So you're looking for those things like temperature changes. Sweating is another thing asymmetrically that can happen with the sympathetic nervous system. They're sweating on one side than the other. Uh, it could be you know, swelling more on one side that doesn't go away after a week or so. So all of these things as a good doctor you're looking for to say there's some asymmetrical changes that show abnormal function of the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. The third criteria that's important, and by the way, this, everything I'm telling you is documented by, in the scientific literature, is that you have to rule out other possible explanations. So, for example, oh, and RSD is far more common in women than men, about 60-40 in adults, and children is far more common, you know, like little girls get it, far more common than little boys. The, the, um, the, uh, Let's put it this way. Uh, the, the important thing is to be able to look for the asymmetry between the two sides of the body. And, and when you see that, you know you're probably not dealing with something like rheumatoid arthritis. On the other hand, if a woman comes in and says, my hand is cold out here, it'd be cold because you got breast cancer. So you have to be able to do a good differential diagnosis. That's the bottom line. All right, so let's, let's stop talking about Let's stop talking about the diagnosis. Let's talk now about uh, how do you measure RSD objectively in terms of clinical outcome. Um, the, the, prompt, the challenge is that pain is a perception. You know, studies show that, for example, some cultures are more, cry easier than other cry. cry. They complain more than others. Gender and so forth and so on. But we can measure, especially for things like RSD, we can measure it objectively. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? We know that what happens when we get this RSD to pain, your, your whole body, especially in the area where it's been injured and has spread, is far more sensitive to pressure. So they say, ouch, when you squeeze your fingers sooner than others. Well, take advantage of that. So you can take a device, okay? And we put pressure on the skin. So I think I think Alberto was a, was asking me earlier. Well, how accurate is this? How precise? More importantly, how precise is it? There's a difference between accuracy and precision, isn't there? Okay. So how precise is this? Can I go up to Alberto and do a test? We haven't done this before, have we, Alberto? Have we? No. So yeah. this is this is me mm -hmm. approaching you without having ever. And I have to use my glasses for it. Oh, here they are, right here. <laughs> so I can read these numbers. Your eyes. So we're going to see how precise this is, right? We haven't done you before. All right, so we're going to get your thumb up here. Or did we? Did we, we never did this before, did you, did we? OK, so you're going to, what you're going to do when the pressure sensation turns to pain, and you're not going to look at the numbers, you're going to say, stop, para. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? We'll do a practice one first yeah, so you get ahead, the idea. This, ahead. Is, this is a practice one. So you say you say stop when the pressure turns to pain, okay? We're gonna do another one for practice. Here we go. So you get the idea. Yeah. You okay. say that's stop, right? Stop. Okay, so now we're gonna repeat it. This is the real thing. You ready? 
Yeah, but that's to rub your finger. Then we really fresh fresh with your mouth. fresh with your fingers up, right? Okay. You ready? Yeah. Go ahead. Let's do it. Okay. Say stop when the pressure turns to pain. Okay. Okay. So that was uh, so everybody knows that was a three five, right? Uh -huh. Three five. Now we do it again. Okay. What's that number? 3.5, right. You ready for the last one? Always do three. Okay. Humberto, what is that number? No, this, I think. Oh, 3.5. Now that's what we call precision. Okay? Now say actually, but it's precision, it's reproducible. That is a pain that holds. May I? Sure, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. This is what we call being a control. We're doing a, 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 a randomized multi center study. You're on the other part of it. You say stop. I have to do a couple of practice so you know what I'm talking about, okay? So when pressure turns to pain, we call that a pain threshold. You're going to say stop. Okay, here it goes. This is a practice one. Yes. Okay. Now, you ready for the real thing? Okay, here it goes. Yes. Okay, what's that number? About uh, 3 to 25, uh, would you three, say? Three, 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 five, six, seven. Uh, probably about 325, approximately, yeah, right? Approximately, yeah. Okay, here we go, and here's another one. Yes. What's that number? 3 5, right? Uh, it's a bit more. Four, four, yeah. 3-5 approximately? Yeah, 3-5, yes. Okay, yes, yes. Una mas. 3-5. <laughs> yes. So that's approximately about 325, yeah, 3 five. Yes, yes. So what does that mean? Yeah, that means he's a bigger baby than you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can handle more pain. Yeah. <laughs> I said, the whole is too hard. Okay, so the point, I, the point I want to make, if you look at this in terms of uh, scientific measurements, that's pretty damn precise, okay? So this is a valuable tool. Let me give an example of what happens to a patient. Now we're recording, now we're going to record on this thing here. If I turn it on, how about if I turn it on? I think that'd be a good idea. This is our left side. This is how much pressure was required before we treated her for four days of ketamine. After four days of ketamine, look, she's off the scale. Not to fall, not to fall, fight, fall. Four days. She's off the scale. It takes far more pressure yeah. on her heel to trigger the pain. And you see a similar result here for her heel. And you can see also that it's not just in her leg where she got injured. It's in her upper extremity as well. Now, what does that tell you? You just witnessed between the two of you how precise this is. You know, as a doctor, that you help the patient. You don't know when they say, oh, Dr. Umberto, you are the greatest thing since 7-Up. You don't know. You think they're just patronizing you. But here you know. Why is that important? Because as a doctor, you want to know that you're helping the patient. If those numbers were going down, you know that you're not helping the patient. And maybe you need to rethink two things. One, maybe you didn't get the right diagnosis. Maybe the drug this treatment does not work, okay? So you as, you as the doctor need to have the assurance to know that you're helping the patient. The patient needs to know that you're helping them. I have patients that say, doc, my wife, I don't know if she's any better. I show them this and they go, holy crap. I don't know, this crap a word in, 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 in Spanish? <laughs> You know, the patient knows that you help them. So you can show them this, and you feel confident that you're helping the patient. Now, this is just one parameter. It's just only one parameter that tells you that you're helping the patient, okay? Now, okay, now we're gonna move on to another parameter that's important. And that is, you have a patient come in. Now, I got it in my leg, doctor, but I can't comb my hair. I can't brush my teeth, and you think, oh God, it's in the way. How the hell could it affect the head? So you do the you do the pain thresholds and you see, for example, here in her upper extremity, 
her pain thresholds are lower. They're abnormal, and then they get normal. And by the way, we've done normal people, and we know that what's normal and what's not, what, what's abnormal. Okay. So, but another way to measure independently, objectively, is movement. So the patient, I can't feed myself. So you do these measurements before, and you do it afterwards. What? Range of motion and strength. So now I'm going to show you an example of that on a video recording of what I'm talking about. And um, so that's what we're going to do now, assuming we're recording, and we are. So now we're going to go to the video part of this thing. So we're going to go over here to, um, oh, actually what we're going to do is going to close this for a minute, like this. And we're going to go back over to here. And now we're going to go to this patient. This is a young 19-year-old girl. I say it's more common in little, girl, in, in little girls, but also in, in women, as, you know, in, in the younger age. Probably around 20, 30 years old. So this is only a nice, I think she's 19 years old. She's a young girl. So we're going to try. And by the way, keep in mind, as a doctor, there's a certain amount of doctor-patient relationship that goes on. And what do I mean by that? These patients are scared. They've been suffering for years. And they don't know, you know, just Dr. Kirkpatrick, who's he? So one of the things you'll see here, this is how I interact with patients. Some of it's kind of goofy. Like I tease them, I play with them a little bit. You get them to relax a little bit because they, they're scared, they're frightened. Everything is, nothing's worked. And who are you? Are you going to just be another one of those doctors? So get, keep that in mind as you watch this. This is the way I, I interview them. It may not work for you, but it works for me. Okay, here it goes. So we're going to do that right now. So today's January uh, 12, uh, 2014. Let's go over your history just a little bit. About a year and a half ago, you had an accident involving primarily that left lower extremity, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, no fractures were involved. Shortly thereafter, you were diagnosed with this reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And there have been several options that have been discussed, including but not limited to things like uh, epidural injections and local injections. And we talked a lot about that, where the local injections can, if you have CRPS or complex regional pain syndrome, can actually make things worse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so let's uh, let's uh, ask you a question. Uh, now you've given this a lot of thought, right? Yes. Uh, so what um, what what made you come uh, to the conclusion that this is probably the best option for you? Um, I didn't feel like there was any other option for me that would work as well as this would. Um, I've tried other things like medication and no progress. Okay. Um, just okay. things have been worse. Right. Okay, so I'm going to stop for a second and, and just make a comment. Okay, one of the things you want to do as a doctor, especially in the United States, I don't know how it is here, it's called informed consent. Uh -huh. yeah. You want to make sure this patient has decided to do this through thinking, They're through thinking, of, she didn't come in yesterday and I decided this would, no, she came in a week before and she thought about it, and now I'm asking her to explain why she decided on this treatment. And what she's gonna tell you is, doctor, look, it's not in my leg anymore, it's in my arms, it's in my face, I can't eat, I can't open my mouth, or very well, and now she, now she, so I have documented on the record with the video mm -hmm. that she understood. In the United States, not here. Malpractice is a big problem. Yes. Mucho, mucho problema. So now it isn't, Dr. Kirkpatrick gave her the opportunity to be informed about what she's going in. Because remember, what I am going to do, uh, Martha, go look at me over here. You're having witness. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give her ketamine, and basically I'm going to cut her head off. I'm going to cut her head off. There's going to be no signals going from here to the brain. She's 19 years old. And that's what ketamine does. It's called dissociative anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Her, her father's there, her mother's there, etc. So I want to make sure that this patient understands what she's what she's getting into. She's 19 years old. And I think in Florida, I, I mean scarf me, I think in, in, in Cuba it's the same as the United States. 18 is a year of consent. Am I correct? Yeah. 18.29 days. Jeez, how does he know that? <laughs> How does he know that? <laughs> I have to deal with that. You have to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, that's very good, very good. Thank you. Okay, so that's why I ask the, always ask that question, and it's documented on the report. One more point I want to make. You say, well, Dr. Kirkpatrick, she is just, she's, she's only 19 years old. Her parents are there, and they're disclosing 
personal health information, right? They say witness. Right. And in the United States, the government, my government, considered a serious criminal offense. If you disclose, they can put you in jail, they can fine you huge amounts of money if you disclose personalized health information. You're going to see in this recording later on, I say, are you okay with me using this for educational purposes? I ask the parents, I ask the mother. You'll see that later on in the recording. So that's the second point I want to make on this. When you're going to do these recordings, make sure, I don't know how it is in Cuba in terms of informed consent as far as disclosure of personalized health information, but it's extremely important in the United States. Okay? All right, let's continue. Right, right. And of course, yeah, your, your CRPS, uh, as we've measured all the measurements on you, su suggests it's just not in that left lower extremity. You have right. it throughout your whole body. And so what the ketamine does, it treats the whole body. It's not just treating that isolated part of your body. Okay, mm -hmm. as the blocks will do, for example. Okay, now, um, are you ready to do some uh, testing here so we can get a, a, a very objective picture of where you started here? Yes. Okay, so let's do this. I want you to take, do the vertical finger test. Remember how that works? You're going to take two mm -hmm. vertical fingers in your mouth. I'm going to ask you if you have any pain in your hand when you do that. And look straight ahead go, go in this direction, okay? All right, get those two vertical fingers. Are you having any pain when you do that? Mm -hmm. okay, point to where you're having the pain, please. Yeah, are you mm -hmm. having it on both sides or yes. just, yeah, and, but it's worse on the left side. Is that mm -hmm. correct? It's sort of in the jawline, yes. correct? Okay, next thing I want you to do, Hannah, I want you to take that right hand, put it behind your head, please, as best you can. Are you having any pain when you do that? No. Okay, now do the left uh, hand, uh, hand behind your head, please. Any pain when you do that? Okay, I want you to take that right hand out in front of you, and I want you to open and close it as fast as you can. And are you having pain when you do that? No. Does it feel stiff? Yes. Because you can't really do that very fast, can you? Now do the same thing with the left, please, as fast as you can, okay? All right, very, a little faster there, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Now, are you having any pain over there when you do that? Um, still in my finger. Okay. In that area? Okay, does mm -hmm. it get above your wrist when you do yeah. that? It does get above your wrist? Mm -hmm. Does it get above your elbow when you do that? Um, a little bit. A little bit? Okay, very good, excellent. Yeah. All right, now the uh, next thing I want you to just take both hands out in front of you at the same time, open and close as fast as you can on both sides. Now, you can see the difference there and how stiff uh, that uh, right one is? You can notice the difference there? Yes. Okay, good job. Now, the next thing we're going to do, Hannah, is we're, uh, we're going to ask you to take that pants leg on the left side up. Previously, we marked you where we, where we have what we call allodynia. That's where any type of tactile stimulation, especially light stroking of the skin, causes pain, like a road burn type sensation, right? So what I want you to do, Hannah, I want you to start above or just below your pants leg uh, line there. And I want you to work your way down, and I want you to stop when you start with your eyes closed. Stop when you think it starts to feel like road burn, okay? So we can document that. Right there? Very good. You're very, very close to that line. Okay, now come down the very front of your leg there. Do the same thing. Stop when you get to the area that feels like it's like road burn. Keep your eyes closed, please. Perfect. Now do the, the outside uh, aspect. There you go. Good job. Yeah. Just go on down, stop when you think you get to it, where it is. Perfect, good job. Now, next thing I want you to do is I want you to take that right foot off the ground, and I want you to rotate it for me, please. Add a girl, good job. Wiggle your toes as best you can, please. That's it, hitchhike back to Plant City. Yeah. All right, yeah, I don't know if you're, you're going to have to get a sleeping bag. I don't think you're going to make it. All right, now do the other side, please. Rotate your ankle. Over. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you have any pain when you did that? Um, just a little bit. A little bit more. Did you feel the pain when you did that? Up my leg. It went all the way up your leg. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, and even up into your hip. hip a bit. Up into where you got your hand on your hip there. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Now do the same thing for the other side, please. Rotate. Again, is that triggering pain all the way up your leg? Mm -hmm. But most intense down where your ankle is. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now how high up did it get on this side when you did that? Um, probably about about the same. About the same up to the hip. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Understood. Okay, very good. Now, uh, the next thing we're going to ask you to do is, with your dad's help, he's going to be there to spot you for safety. Yeah, go ahead and bring that down. Atta girl. Good job. He's going to be there to spot you, okay? Atta girl. You're going to go over by the door there. That's it. Very, very good. Very good. Remember what we talked about earlier. I don't want you to do anything that puts you at risk of falling, okay? And I don't want you torturing yourself, but I've got to get an idea of what you can and cannot do. So I want you to take three steps forward, please, for me. One, two, and three. And go on back three steps, please. Don't turn around, just go on, right on back. 
There you go. And when you get back over there, Hannah, I'm going to ask you where you had the pain, okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, tell me. Um, in my ankle, and then I felt it in my knee, and yeah. then in my and your hip, right, yeah. and on that left, and more intense on that left side, yeah. correct? Did you have any pain at all on the right side? Um, not as much as the left. But again, it's, it was down in the foot, yeah. but it went, the pain managed to find its way all the way up into your hip on that side, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Now I want you to hold your dad, for safety, I want you to hold your dad's hand. I want you to try as best you can to see if you can get up on your toes and take three steps forward. Remember what I said, don't even try it if you can't, you can't do it without falling, okay? As best you can. Okay. All right. I get the idea. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to ask you to try to do the same thing with your uh, with your heels. Can you do that, please? Add a girl. There you go. As best you can. All right. One more step, and that'll be it. Okay. Perfect. Now, go ahead and have a seat, please. Now, Dad, one of the things you need to appreciate when, she, when I ask her to do those sorts of things is something like you or I, when we get when we finish doing an exercise like that, it, you know, the pain goes away. Am I correct on this? That pain is still lingering on. Am I correct on that? Yeah, it can last for hours, okay? So we try to limit the amount of torture here. All right. Um, now, uh, let's talk to your dad here for a minute. Dad, you knew it before all this happened some year and a half ago. Why don't you tell me how this has impact on her quality of life? What she was doing before and, and what she's doing now, please. Well, she was doing the normal things that any 17-year-old you know, would do before, uh, prior to this uh, accident mm -hmm. uh, that she had with her. Uh, left foot. Um, I mean, after the accident, this has been an ongoing, uh, constant pain and battle for. I mean, it's uh, it's turned into severe. You know, it's went from her foot to travel throughout her whole body. Right. You know, she's in severe pain. She has, uh, I guess you'd say, kind of tremors or mm -hmm. uh, like like seizure type. Uh, you know, right. Spastic type. Yeah, we talked about shaking, that. Sometimes really the pain bad. is so severe that this happens to you mentally you just get frozen yes sir yeah and it's uh, a normal she, it's a normal body defense every, uh, every one of us has yes, even sir. if we don't have RSD right and we how do we know that and this is important because you're the parents mm -hmm. and you need to understand that this isn't something she has any control over right I you understand. take you take for example take the Japanese prison prisoners you know they took Americans in mm -hmm. and what they would do to these guys to try to get them to talk okay they should take, and I, I hate to put it to you as bluntly as I'm going to put it to you, mm -hmm. they should take piano wires and tie, tie their testicles mm -hmm. and torture them that way. Yes, sir. And what would happen is before the, the prisoners, in order to get through that, they would actually do what she did. They, they'd actually become paralyzed. Yes, sir. That would, and that was the brain as a way of protecting themselves from overwhelming pain. Right. Okay? So right. this is something that all of us are capable of doing. It's just a, a natural body. Uh, response. Right. Uh, animals do the same thing. You take, for example, a deer. You ever heard this? You probably maybe had it. Deer is out in the middle of the road. It's going to get run over by a truck. Mm -hmm. Now, during the day, it may not be a problem, but they get frozen on the bright lights, stimulating them so much that they just freeze right there, and right. they get they get they get whacked. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, I just want to emphasize because because when we have young people in, and we see this a lot in young people, a lot uh, that have CRPS, the parents, uh, you know. They, they're baffled. Doctors are baffled by it, mm -hmm. and they often accuse the patient of being, you know, a fake or right. fictitious and all this kind of crap. But it's, it's a real biological response. It's normal. It's what will happen to anybody that is in severe, extreme pain, unbearable yeah, pain. Absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure I got that on the record. No, that's that's fine. Yeah, we um, recognize and know that you know she's been in severe pain and yeah. has been for quite some time now. Right. Right. And you know. Um, we know that it's definitely uh, it's real, right? And, uh, right. She's right. been affected by it tremendously. I mean, sure. she's not able to do hardly anything. Sure. You know, she's Actually. very very limited on what she can do. Sure. Uh, she can't do any extracurricular activities. Sure. Go out and have any kind sure. of fun. Sure. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does that pretty much tell the story here, Hannah? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, even walking to my bathroom to take a shower, I need help. Yeah. Sure. So if Sure. That tells you. Well, how about limits. some water? Just touch drops of water touching that foot. Washing. Yeah. Um, sure. Pressure of the shower. Sure, sure. Um, Remember what I said. You do have it in your face, okay? Yes. Which means your part of that is your hair. So even brushing your. Some patients we have in here, they can't. They, they can't even shampoo their hair. Right. And some of them actually go ahead and just shave their head. Right. You know, because they for hygienic reasons. Right. And yeah, there's a lot of times, you know, she she can't even stand for her clothes to be touching her hair. Absolutely. Her, um, her, her bed sheets and, and stuff. Right. Yeah, really. Yeah. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Now, Dad, I know you're going to watch this 12-minute video, okay? Yes, so you know what goes on in the room. But at this point, do you have any questions, any concerns that you'd like to ask me? Uh, no, sir. Not right now, I don't. Okay. Let's see if Hannah has anything. Yeah, you have anything, Hannah? Mm -hmm. Okay. In this whole video, because we don't want to spend a lot of time, I want to focus today is on objective measurements of outcome. That's critically, critically important. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the next video and show you what it's like when she's under care, okay? And that's what we're going to do now. Now, what do we do? How do we keep these patients safe? What we do is this. We want to make sure the brain is separated. We want to reboot the brain. When you have problems with your computer, Dr. Humberto, what do you do? What do you do when you can't figure out what's happening? Yeah, re Restart, yeah. right. So that's what we're doing with the brain. The brain isn't any different, okay? Yeah. It takes, what do they say, about half a watt to run the brain. It takes energy and it takes electricity to run the brain. So we're shutting the brain down and letting it come back up, come back up again, each time, over four days, okay? Repetitively, okay? Now you say, well, Dr. Kirkpatrick, are you doing this constantly, all night? No, no. We're shutting it down the first day. And so what you need to understand is this, is that what ketamine does, it inhibits glutamate. What the hell is glutamate? What the hell is glutamate? Well, I'll tell you what it is. If you don't have glutamate, you don't feel pain. Children born without glutamate, and you know what? They die, usually. About five, seven, they bleed to death. They don't even know they cut themselves. People who get C complex regional pain syndrome or who get fibromyalgia, the glutamate levels go up, 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 up. So what ketamine does is it inhibits glutamate. So therefore, it shouldn't surprise you give, you give ketamine, and it increases their pain while they're getting ketamine, right? Okay, that, that's, but what is surprising is that the pain relief can last for months. The, cat, the ketamine's gone. It's redistributed throughout the body, it's, it's eliminated. But the pain relief can last for months. Now, here's what's important. If you give ketamine the first day, you take the glutamate levels down to here. If you don't give it the next day, it just climbs right back up again. So what we do over four days, we take it down to this level the first day. Come back the next day, we take it down to here. And then we take it down to here. And then we take it down to there. That's why we don't have to put patients in coma anymore as much as we used to. And before, we just put them in coma for five days in intensive care unit. Mucho, mucho dinero. Muy, muy, caro. Now, not necessary. We do have some patients we have to put in a coma because they're too sick. You can't treat them outpatient. This is all done on an outpatient basis. Okay? So, so that's why we have to give it over four days. We have found through our testing that it takes about four days to get the glutamate levels down and going up. Okay? So now what you're going to see in this next video is what this patient is like. Now, how do we keep the patients from going into coma? Really simple. Really simple. Every 15 minutes, we ask them some questions. So, we want to make, to make sure that they have their long-term memory. Because we don't have long-term memory when you're under a drug, you're going to go into coma. You know that's anesthesiologist, right? On the other hand, the first thing that gets knocked out is your short-term memory. Let me give an example. I'm going to pick on you now. Alberto, are you ready? Can I ask you a question? What country do you live in? Cuba. All right. That's part of your long-term memory, right? Yeah. So that's burned into that disc up there. Yeah. I'm going to ask you another question. May I ask you another question? Yes? See, I noticed under the door there, I noticed that there's a red marble. Now, Alberto, don't look. Can I ask you a question? What did I notice under the door? Fine. Because you open the door and come in. No. Did, what no. did I notice under the door? <laughs> 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 <He told me. laughs> Alberto. I don't get you. Okay, uh, can I ask you another question? Yeah. Another question. Pay attention, Alberto. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the doorknob on that door over there. Don't look. The, the doorknob. The doorknob. Yeah. It is green. Alberto. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? What did I notice about the doorknob over there? How can you know? Because you opened it? No, no. Did you notice? The I color. Noticed, I noticed the color. 
Uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, this green. It's, it's not green. It's, it's, uh, no, well, you answered the question. The question was what color it was, and you know the answer. It was green. It's green. When you're under ketamine, you can't answer that question. It's yeah. not possible. It's part of your short term memory. Yeah. So every 15 minutes, we're yeah, measuring, sure. and a nurse can do this. You don't have to be a doctor to ask a question and get an answer, right? All right. So we want to make sure we kept it. We don't give too much ketamine, but we want to give enough to knock out long-term memory, but keep short-term. Uh, excuse me. We want to get enough to knock out short-term memory, but not long-term memory. So when you're under ketamine, you should be able to answer. You should be able to answer the question: What country you live in, or who's your best friend sitting next to you, what their name is, and so forth. But the pen was saying, Yeah, right, right. But if I tell you, for example. That he's wearing a red watch. A red watch. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What did What did Tony see over there? What did he just see? Red watch. Right. We don't want you to be able to do that when you're under ketamine. Uh, yeah. Because we want to give you enough ketamine yeah. to shut the brain down. You understand? Okay. Wait. Okay. So here we go. So here goes uh, what it's like when you're under ketamine after four days. Okay. While you're under ketamine. Anna. Anna. We're going to do some testing on you. Okay, so just for the record now, we're sitting here at um, uh, January 16, uh, 2015, and she's been on uh, 135 mil. No, she's been on six, uh, 200 milligrams of ketamine now for a good almost an hour or so. And she's on a pretty, pretty stiff dose. Her vital signs have been very stable. Breathing is great. She hasn't had any adverse hallucinations. We've had to deal with some issues with saliva on her, which doesn't surprise us given how young she is, okay? And we control that with some Robinol, but otherwise uh, she's doing pretty good right now. So, um, you, you know this man over here? This is your dad. You see your dad over here? Look over there. Hannah? Hannah. Hmm? Your dad has to ask you a couple questions, okay? That, that lip movement is typical of what we see with patients that have RC. Okay, go ahead, Dad. Hannah. Hmm? What is your dad's name? What's your dad's name? What is your mom's name? What's your dog's name? What is your boyfriend's name? Huh? What is <laughs> what is your boyfriend's name? Huh? What's your boyfriend's name? Huh? I said, what's your boyfriend's name? That's short-term memory, so she, I can understand why she... Okay, Mary, get over there where he is. Mary's got some questions Stay, for you. Stick All right. You recognize Mary over here? You remember Mary? Hi, Hannah. Look over there. There's Hannah. Me. Yeah, you see Mary? Mary's got some questions for you, okay? Hannah. Are you ready? Hannah. Mm. Mary's got a question. some questions for you. Go ahead, Mary. Hannah. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Hannah, I noticed your dad is wearing green glasses. Hannah, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. What did I notice about your dad? Hannah, you need to pay attention, okay? Can you pay attention? Hmm? You want to pay attention to Mary? See? Yes? Hi, Hannah. Hi. Listen to Mary, okay? Listen to Mary. Go ahead, Mary. Hannah, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Hannah, mm -hmm. can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Hannah, I notice your dad is wearing a pink shirt. Hannah, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. What did I notice about your dad? No response. Anna? No, no. She's given. She's given us the information that we need. Okay. Mm -hmm. She can answer the short-term things more or less, right? Right. But she can't really handle anything new. Okay. Which is which is fine. Okay. All right. Very good. We're all set. Okay. So what you've learned from this is she's she's kind of almost losing her her long-term memory as well, she's, right? Shut up. Huh? It's not completely. Not completely. She knew her dad's name. She knew a few things, and. When you ask her a question, can I ask you a question? She says yes. So she has some left. 
Yeah, yeah. Some brain function left. Not much. But Not much. Yeah, if I tell her to take a deep breath, she will do the usual take a deep breath. She will do that for you. Okay. For my, how many hours do you do? Four hours each time. Well, so it's 800 milligrams. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a lot. For us as anesthesiologists, that's four but, but here's what you have. Hair is more or less uh, uh, four milligrams per kilo. She's about 50 kilograms. Yes, that's correct. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Now you say, Tony, why? How come she's not under general anesthesia? Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because we started low and gradually, <laughs> gradually <laughs> worked up. There was in no, It was in not. No well, induction. No, not, not induction. No, no. No, no. Now, the other question is, why, why doesn't she have an adverse hallucinations? Why not? Because the very slow link is saying. Yes. Yeah, very but more important, muy, muy importante, muy importante. You notice that her father is by her bedside. Yes. With the, someone that's familiar with her long-term memory who's in the room, it's huge in preventing them to slip into an adverse hallucination. And she's not asleep. She's awake. When they have adverse hallucinations, they usually doze off. Boom. Why is it so terrifying? Imagine this. You are here at the National Hotel today. You wake up and you have a bad dream. You're at your home. You have a bad dream. Which place would you rather be if you're having, when we all do, no matter how old we are, if you're normal? We have bad dreams. And you wake up and you have this bad dream. Would you rather be at the National Hotel or would you rather be at home? At the book. Of course. Because when you wake up, oh, there's my uh, yeah. ceiling there, fan. Yeah. There's this. I'm not lost. Yeah, I'm not lost. I'm, they're not eating my legs off. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's critically important. Never, ever do high dose ketamine without having a significant other by the bedside. And by the way, doctors, let me tell you something. It takes a lot of workload off you. Guess who's measuring her cognitive function right now? It's not me. It's the father. It's the mother. That's less work for you, right? Less work for you, it means you can do other things with your time. Okay? All right. Que pasa? Que cuando dijiste, boom, por poco se me cae la cama. She falling asleep? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. She gets scared. She has something to do with it. He said, Mom, what happened in here? What is happening here? That scare her? That's a good OK, so. <laughs> Martha, Martha. No, Martha, don't, don't. I don't. Suave, suave. suave. It's a date, suave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, Martha, you know, like this, you know, like this, you know? <laughs> okay, so so those are some key points. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what, how she responds in terms of her function, okay? Again, another independent parameter, an independent measurement that we can make on her. So that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to go over here, and we're going to do that right now, okay? All right, so here we go. You get this uh, solution? Well, 200 million per hour for four hours, and how long it takes to recover? Immediately, almost. Immediately. It's like, this is a good, uh, Alberto's asking a, an important question, so let me respond. Ketamine has a, a very rapid redistribution re re half-life, okay? So what does that mean in simple language? That means that when you turn the ketamine infusion off, it leaves the brain quickly, very quickly. So quickly it's like the patient, like she saw her, I turn it off and all of a sudden, boom, she's awake. Talking and so forth. Now let me tell you while we're on that, what are some common problems that can happen in terms of adverse things? Yeah, yeah. One of the things you saw, her salivate, yeah. okay? Yeah, Especially in young people. You know, you've done kids with cat, you know, they just drool all over their face. So we have, so we have Robinol, what we call glycopyrrolate in the United States. You can give them a little of that, 0.2 milligrams IV takes care of that, and it's important to take care of it because it's uncomfortable when patients are salivating Do you over. use it? Of course. Because if I don't use it, they salivate, okay? Yes. And it comes down on the floor, the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And then you start sliding all over it. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and I've heard it go, Tony, you're exaggerating. <laughs> a little bit. Un poquito. Well, I have been using ketamine for 40 years almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know. You know? Yeah, yes. Especially in young people. Especially. Yes, especially. Okay. You have to use glucobor relay. You have to. Atropine. You have to, yeah. I prefer not atropine because it causes cardiac. No, no, I know, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so um, so that's so what's, what else can happen? Some people, you know, women. You know how women are. You, hey, I'm no, no. You know how women are, right? Usually. <laughs> Hormone dependent. Because it's famous. And that's the big thing. Yes. <laughs> Hormone dependence. No. The thing is, when you look at women, you, no matter what you give them, they, they get nausea, they get queasy much easier than men do. Right? Yes. You take the bottle of ketamine, you just move it in front of them like that, and they get sick, you know? <laughs> the thought does it, you know? Okay, so my point is this, is that, so nausea and vomiting is something that can happen. So you have, um, you keep making sure that they're hydrated, you make sure that um, if they are that way, you give them some prophylactic before. For example, you can give them, um, Zofran, orally, mm -hmm. an hour before they come in. You know, 24 milligrams is a good dose, okay? Okay. All right, PO, okay? Um, during infusion, what I found is a very good drug for nausea and vomiting. Drugs been around for decades. Dexamethasone. Yes, I know. It works fantastic. Or droperidol. Uh, droperidol, yes. The problem with that is it causes other things, you know, the yes, brain yeah, and crazy. Like the minimum dose crazy. Yeah, minimum, minimum. Point, yes. 62, but, it, but you don't get that with Zofran. No, no. But and, and, and you can get here in Cuba probably a reasonably price. Oh, we have suffered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so um, dexamethasone is not that expensive. Okay, so I recommend dexamethasone. Virtually no side effects. Okay, and what do I give in a situation like that? Twelve milligrams IV push. You know, remember what? Is, I, I'm, I'm deviating a little bit. What the, you know what's fascinating about dexamethasone? You know what's dexamethasone? You know what's fascinating? To me, it's fascinating. You give dexamethasone. If you give it too fast, you get a pain in your groin. What the hell causes that? In the groin. I don't know. But it happens. So you tell the patient, you may feel a little soreness down if you give it too fast. Okay, all right. So now, so the point I want to make is that we rarely ever have adverse. When Dr. Schwartz, when we started ketamine over a decade ago, using it for these patients, when we started using it, we had huge problems with adverse hallucinations. Patients were tearing out their IVs, yelling and screaming and doing all kinds of terrible things. We hardly ever, ever see that anymore. No moss, okay? All right, so, so that answers that question. But nausea vomiting is something we see not so much in men, but in women, okay? And it's treatable. It, the first day you pay attention, you see if it looks like it's gonna be a problem, and you give them prophylactic before they come in. If they come and say, Doc, every time I get medicine, I get sick, you give it to them before they come. Okay, it's that simple. So those are the only two things you have to worry about when you give it like this, okay? Nausea, vomiting. If they have an adverse hallucination, which is extremely rare, give it a little bit more midazolam, but try to stay away from midazolam. You give it at the beginning, no problem. But try to stay, because the more midazolam you give, the more they're gonna slip into a deeper anesthesia, and you're not gonna get as much ketamine. Okay, all right. All right, let's move on to uh, how she did after, after her treatment, okay? Okay, Hannah, today is the uh, 19th of January, and uh, that means it's about two to three days after your last ketamine infusion, which was on uh, Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just did your pain thresholds, and of course there was a dramatic improvement in your pain thresholds, okay? And um, so uh, what I'm going to do right from the very beginning here is I'm going to kind of talk about how things went during the infusion itself, okay? So you were there, Dad. Mom was there. You know, the whole family practically there, didn't we? Yes. And uh, we did run into an issue in the beginning with some little queasiness and nausea. You know, she has a history of migraine, so that doesn't surprise anybody. Okay. But we were able to get it under control with uh, giving her some Zofran before she came in, mm -hmm. orally, and she had some Decadron during the procedure, as well as some uh, glycopyrrolate or Rubinol, which keeps her from accumulating a lot of saliva which uh, can be extremely uncomfortable if you're under the influence of ketamine. Mm -hmm. But we got it under control. Would you agree with that? Yes. You didn't have any adverse hallucinations during the, uh, during the treatment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that wasn't a problem. Uh, the one thing that limited us was you would go, you went too deep. And uh, 
where you had difficulty uh, answering questions, and we're going to go over that with you a little bit in, in more detail here in a minute, okay? Um, so, um, uh, but we got you up to 200 milligrams, 200 milligrams now, on the okay? So that's a, that's a very good dose. Are you ready to do some exercise to see what happened here with you? Yes. Okay, let's do the vertical finger test. Look straight ahead, don't look at me. Put two vertical fingers in your mouth. Are you having any pain when you do that? Remember, you had pain on the right side of your face, mm -hmm. and on the left, worse on your left side of your face, and on your right side of your face. You don't have that now. Mm -hmm. Take that right hand, put it behind your head, please. Have any pain when you do that? Mm -hmm. Didn't have one when we started, you don't have now. Now put the left hand behind your head. You didn't have any pain there when you started, and now you, you still don't. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, take the right hand, put it out in front of you. Open and close it as fast as you can. Less stiff, huh? It's about as much faster, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Any pain when you do that? Didn't have pain when you started, you don't have now. But right? you did have pain when you tried to do that with your uh, left side. Go ahead and open and close as fast as you can. Much faster now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you still have that pain, remember, around your thumb and your finger? Yeah. Don't have that now. Put both hands out in front of you. Open and close as fast as you can. Much faster now, huh? Mm -hmm. So what is it? You're going to start to play the piano? Is that what you're going to do? Mm -hmm. Huh? No? Okay. Maybe. Violin. Violin? Is that right? She plays uh, the violin. Oh, is that right? Oh, before all this happened, she was doing that, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, that's interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, next thing we're going to do here is we're going to ask you to roll up that pants leg on your, uh, on your left side there. And we have these marks on you where you had the allodynia, another real sensitive skin that felt like road burn before we started. So I want to test that now to see if that's disappeared. So go ahead and start above that black mark, but close your eyes so you don't cheat. That's right, light stroke and see if you still have any of that, that road burn sensation. Any of that down there anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, yeah, and go down the other side there. There you go. All gone? Yes. Okay, very good, excellent. Now the next thing I want you to do is I want you to rotate that right ankle for me, please. There you go. You know, less, less stiff there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Have any pain when you do that? No. Now do the worst side, which is your left side. Go ahead, rotate. Any pain when you do that? No. no. Huh? Not really. Not really. And listen, while we're on that subject, remember we talked about the fact that you haven't been walking, you, you're out of shape, right? It's mm -hmm. not your fault. That just happens to everybody that gets, especially in the lower extremity. And we talk, we're going to talk more about how to get rid of that, what we call muscle pain. That's not RSD pain. Yes. We're going to talk about that later. But you even notice how much better range of motion you have down there. You mm -hmm. That foot will help a lot better than you did before. Okay. Look at your toes for us. All right. Can you hitch, hitchhike back to Plant City? Oh, look, she can do it. Mm -hmm. All right, very good, excellent. I'm going to stand by the door there. Dad's going to be by your side just as a safety precaution. Okay? The color is better, too. Yeah. Well, it's even going to improve a lot more than it is right now with the exercise, okay? She's got to reestablish circulation down there in those legs, okay? Uh, go ahead and take three steps forward, please. Just regular walking. That a girl. You're much more secure now, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Go on back, please. There you go. Remember, you had pain going all up to your hips when you did that before. What's going on now? Not the same kind. It's that more of that muscle pain, just from being out of shape, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, and that's the kind of break, that's the kind of pain you can live with. You can't live with the pain that sucks the breath out, right? Okay. Yeah, it takes your breath away. No, you can't do that. Okay. Now, next thing I want you to do is you couldn't even do this before, but see if you can take three steps forward on your toes. Your dad's there if you need him for balance. Okay. See if you can do that now. One. Two and three. Very good. Good job. Now, that did that give you the same pain you had before? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, is it the same oh, pain? Oh, no, not the same as the Right, same right. Pain. Now, listen, we talked about another thing, didn't we? We talked about the fact that you've got to learn how to walk again. Remember, you have not been walking, okay? Yes. So it's going to take a while, like anybody, to pick that, uh, pick that up again, how to walk, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing we're going to do is just for completeness, going to ask you to see what you can do on your heels. Go ahead. One, two, and three. That's good. And again, do you still have that pain you had before? Uh, before we treated you? No. Okay, have a seat, please. All right, now, let's go over the treatment plan here. And again, if there's something you don't understand, you can interrupt me and we'll get it clarified, okay? All right, now. Um, we, we talked about the heat of pull exercises, three days a week, no more than 20 minutes each time. The water temperature should be between 82 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. We talked about, you know, getting yourself one of these little uh, 
digital thermometers, you know, that uh, you can use that will help you um, with uh, uh, gauging whether you should even get in the water. So if it's 80 or 81 degrees, you probably don't even want to go in the water that day, okay? All right. Now, the other thing we talked about, uh, the four reasons why this works, okay? Reason one is you're not ready for full weight bearing. And in fact, it's kind of risky because you can fall and re-injure yourself, which is the most common reason why patients have a relapse, okay? Number two, the water is a very, very potent desensitizer. So it'll even desensitize your skin so you can tolerate, you know, the touch better than you even now, okay? And the third thing we talked about is, uh, is many times over and over again, you need to avoid exercises that can result in re-injury, okay? And water is an exercise you can do where you're least likely to re-injure yourself, okay? And the fourth thing we talked about is this. We talked about this thing called stress, right? And uh, stress. Remember what we said about stress? Is it good or bad? Very good. You've got your brain. How about that? She, can, she, she remembers. That's good. So your brain power. And by the way, let me, while we're on that subject, let me tell you, you're probably going to find it a lot easier for you to focus now when you don't have so much pain, okay? So learning is going to be a much easier task for you, okay, going forward. That's right, it's neutral. What the heck is neutral? What is that? Well, stress is a biological response you can't control. And you can make it either a negative or a positive experience. And one of the things we've learned over the years is that there's one thing that always predictably works in controlling stress and keeping it from being negative. What's that called, Dad? What's that? What's that? What's that activity that we talked about that can keep the stress under control? Physical activity. There you go. Very good. I got the memory works well in the whole family here. Very good. By the way, he scored high. He's got the highest score from me so far. <laughs> okay, that's right. Physical. So water exercise is physical activity and helps control the stress. So therefore, you're not going to get in a, butt in a pool with a bunch of kids, are you? You're gonna. You're gonna. Get, whether they're yelling and screaming and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now. The, uh, the next thing we talked about is medications. Now, you're not on any uh, strong medications. We call those narcotics like Vicodin, Percocet, and all that kind of stuff. But we did say there is a role for those in treating RSD, isn't there? Yeah. Do, if you get acute injury, like for example, you go to the dentist and he starts going in there and starts doing a lot of things in your mouth, you can't handle the stress like the, the pain from that as, as other people can. And it can set off the RSD, right? Yes. Okay. Now, let's... Uh, Let's turn over to um, to the parents here. You've been with her over the weekend. What do you think? Has your, has her mood improved? Is she seeing a little bit more hopeful? Dad will start yeah. with you. Yes, sir. She's improved a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. her mood, her attitude has just has changed a lot over the weekend. Uh, she's been able to do activities over the weekend that she hasn't been able to do in you know a year and a half. Yeah. And uh, we know and we're optimistic about it. and know that they're just going to continue to get better. Right. With the uh, you know, physical treatment and uh, physical exercise and uh, just uh, really look forward to it. I'm so happy that uh, she's doing good. Right. Now, uh, did you have any questions? Uh, no, sir. No, okay. Sir. And uh, Mom, would you, do you have any, uh, would, would you kind of agree with all that? Yes. Yeah. And, and she's really enjoying taking a bath now. They don't feel, the water doesn't feel like a razor blade. So right, very right. Well, I'm glad you brought that up right. because, you know, being able to take care of yourself and hygiene and all that kind of stuff is really, really important, okay? Even eating. Remember, she had a lot of jaw pain. Before, right. Mm -hmm. So she can enjoy eating now, which she couldn't do before. Mom, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back over here to Hannah. Hannah, um, did you have anything to add to what your mom and dad said about the experience? No. Okay. Uh, how about you? Do you have any questions? Now, I have a question for everybody here. Now, um, you know, we always try to learn from experience and share that with others. Uh, are all you comfortable with using uh, this recording? And, of course, she's going to be back in about a month or two, and we're going to repeat all this. Are all you comfortable with the idea of sharing this information uh, uh, with others out there that they can learn from your experience? Is that okay with you, Hannah? Let's make sure it's okay with your parents. Is that okay with you? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Just want to make sure. Okay. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to summarize for you what we call the take home message, okay? I wanted you to see the video. I wanted you to see the pain thresholds. I wanted to test both of you so you can appreciate the precision of the measurement, reproducibility of the measurement, so that you could see that 
the focus here is on objective measurements. So you as a doctor can feel confident that you're helping the patient and you're not harming them. Especially when you're doing something new. This is new. This didn't exist. And it's still being evolved in the United States right now. I have doctors coming to us. We're a nonprofit, or they come to us to learn how to do this properly. And if you don't do it properly, it will not succeed. But this most important thing I want you to get from this discussion today, informal first acquaintance and so forth, is the idea of objective measurements and how important that is. Not just for you, but for the patient as well. Okay?